Hi everybody, we're back. This is Dave Vellante of Wikibon. I'm here with at Stu, Stu Miniman of Wikibon as well. This is theCUBE, Silicon Angle's continuous production live from IBM Edge. We're here at the Mandalay Bay Hotel in wonderful Las Vegas. Stu, we spend more time in Las Vegas in uh, May and June. Yeah, Dave, yeah. everybody's been asking if we have like, you know, the, the cube like, you know, bungalow where we can all just stay here. Our equipment lives here, but luckily we even, don't. Even my kids now, when I talk to them at night, they say, hey daddy, how's lost wages? Do you still have your shirt? <laughs> and, uh, anyway, Ron Reif is here. Ron is the storage software business strategy head for the group formerly known as Tivoli, now the cloud and smarter infrastructure group. Ron. Welcome to theCUBE. Oh, it's good to be here, thanks. Yeah, good to see you again. Um, so, let's see, I'm not going to ask you about the, the group name. You told me off camera that uh, that's, that's something that others make the decision on, so right. but congratulations on the, uh, the transformation. Let's Thank just, you. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> um, so, big talk about uh, SDS here. I want to get into that, but, but before we do, let's talk about your role. So you, in a strategy role, and I mean a lot of companies kind of don't want to be in a strategy role. IBM is a great place to be in a strategy role because you actually have impacts on decisions, M&A, uh, you've got ways to leverage the portfolio, internal, external collaboration, very exciting role. So what specifically are you doing you know, within the division, within the group, uh, in a strategy role? Well, my job in, in business strategy is to go spend time with clients, understand their business. We've been talking a lot this week about economics. My job is to understand the economics of their business problems. What is it that is uh, causing them grief in IT, specifically in the area of storage? Um, think about what the solutions that IBM has from a technological standpoint, from research, that we could bring to bear to solve those problems, and then work out the economics of, can we invest enough money into it, create the solution, charge clients in such a way that they get value, get their problems solved, and we end up making money. So I'm a, I'm a sort of a business strategist, investment strategist for storage software. And you have to figure out how to do that and, and get a return, as you said. Get a return. And so there's external factors involved in, in that. There's tectonic shifts, there's drivers, there's, 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 there's other influencers, uh, there's competition. Right. You, you, you factor all that in. Um, now, is it, is it the Ron Reif methodology? Does IBM <laughs> have some kind of methodology? Is it a little bit of both? We have processes, procedures that we follow, but, but it, there is a lot of an art form to it, trying to understand what, what the bad guys are up to, um, listening very closely to what the analysts are telling us, um, you know, understanding. Bad guys being hackers or competitors? No, no, competitors. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no hacking. We talked a lot about information <laughs> security this week, too. We, we're not involved in any of that. Right, right. Um, but, but just keeping our ear to the ground on what's happening in the marketplace and what technologies are coming out of research. So I spend a lot of time with clients, a lot of time with analysts, a lot of time with, uh, with our researchers, our developers, you know, just trying to put together the entire puzzle and, um, and help guide decisions on where do we put our investment dollars, can we get the technology out the door quick enough to be competitive in the marketplace and make a good return. Okay, so what's the, what's the market telling you? You spend a lot of time with customers, you know, reading the analyst reports, talking to analysts. What are the big trends that you're seeing that are driving some of your advice to your, to your colleagues and some of the decisions that you guys are making within the division? You know, there's a there's a macro trend. Um, it's really sort of simple, but um, but it's one that you have to sort of back off and look at for a moment. For for decades and decades, um, we've been dealing with you know data is growing. Um, my whole career at IBM and even before then, we, we've been worried about um, data is is it going to get too big? Can we afford to store it? Um, for decades. Data was growing, but the, the the hardware vendors that were building storage systems were able to improve aerial density a little bit more quickly than the data was growing. So, from a client perspective, an IT manager, the the solution to the problem of data growth was they bought a current generation storage device that was denser, had a better price per gigabyte, and they were able to keep up, keep that budget moving relatively flat while data was growing. In the last several years, it's been fairly well documented now that data is, is growing faster than hardware vendors' ability to keep up with area density improvements. And so what's happening is if, if the old way of doing um, uh, storage administration doesn't change, 
CIOs, IT managers are going to end up spending more and more and more of their IT budget on disk hardware because they have to have more of it. Um, and so it's driving um, shifts. One of those shifts is this move towards software-defined storage. So part of me says, why don't you guys all just sit back and let it happen and you make a ton of money. But uh, we all know that would kill the market. <laughs> so it would kill, kill innovation. Kill Kill, yeah. and you'd kill yeah. our clients, right? They wouldn't be able to afford to. Something, something has to change. So, Venture capital would come in and solve the problem. So, and you see, you know, Hadoop, in many respects, was designed to solve that problem, and others. Uh, so, okay, so that's a that's a that's a major shift that you see. So, let's talk about software defined. Um, let's start with what is it? What is it? What is it to IBM? Uh, yeah. So, software. The, <laughs> one of the big difficulties in the industry has been settling on a, a definition. You know, we'll, we'll come up with an idea and we'll communicate it one way and um, you know, vendor X, competitor Y will come up with a different way and everybody's trying to co-opt the, the term. Uh, our view is very similar to what IDC recently um, sort of communicated as a full taxonomy of what is software, they called it software-based storage. Um, is that it's a, it's a software layer um, that gives the full set of storage services, but does it on commodity hardware and it's not in any way tied to back-end disk capacity. It's just a, it's a means of managing um, storage with, uh, with commodity hardware. In, in a lot of ways, it's very similar to what has happened in the server marketplace with uh, server hypervisors. Today, when you talk about a server, you're not talking about a physical machine. It's a virtual machine that can live on any kind of commodity-based hardware. And what's happened is that all the function has moved into that software layer, relatively inexpensive um, compared to the rest of the IT budget, and it's allowed the hardware to commoditize. And it's um, and given CIOs, IT managers, a lot more flexibility and a, an ability to drive down the overall cost of servers in their budget. Same thing's happening in storage. So, so Ron, I'm wondering if I could poke on that because yep. I, I really, I don't know that I agree that kind of software defined and commoditization, uh, I, I think they, there's a connection, but I don't think they necessarily go hand in hand. When I think about what server virtualization did, it did not necessarily commoditize. We're not everybody's not running around running white boxes. Server virtualization changed the architecture of hardware. And sure, we collapsed down and consolidated, got greater efficiencies. But you know, IBM's still selling lots of servers, sure. and they're actually selling bigger servers for the most part. You know, beefier cores, uh, everything that, like that. Um, if I look at um, both networking and especially storage, the, one of the big differences is if we go to come some kind of software layer, it's not going to collapse how much hardware I need. As, as you were saying before, so, you know, storage growth we can't keep up with. So, sure. you know, software defined is not going to reduce how much you know capacity I need. It's going to keep increasing. So, True. Um, I, I guess. You know, well, kind of depends better. on what you mean by commodity, right? Yeah. So, so, uh, but, but let's let's. Let's give Ron a little latitude here. Let me try to let me try to uh, weigh in on this. You've basically said like servers got mm -hmm. you know, let's say got commoditized, and what what allowed that was a virtualization layer, an abstraction layer. So basically, you're talking about abstracting the underlying hardware. That's right. right? Okay. Well, and, and that leads to you can essentially then run that on what we're calling commodity commodity storage. Right. Um, so so I, mean, I think it's a fair question. The the the, in the server world, you're, you're right, not everybody's running on white boxes, but um, you, you have the flexibility to run on a white box if you want to, yeah. or an IBM System and, X system. And, and, or and, and what I'd say is, you know, of course we got, any workload really can go on x86 this day, so yeah. it's standardization uh, kind of across there. And, and the, the, the value um, has moved up into the software layer, and so there's, there's not a lot of, I mean, the differentiation in the servers, they provide the MIPS, the, the megahertz that are needed for compute, but that's about all they provide. They provide that and maybe reliability. That's the differentiation that you can come in. Same thing's going to happen in storage. The, you're right that you're not going to stop um, the need for gigabytes, but what you're going to get out of the storage device other than gigabytes and, and maybe availability and IOs per second 
Not much, because all the rest of the services come out of the software layer. Yeah, and, and, and I'd agree. We're talking about it's the services and the value that you add, not you know the sheet metal and, and, and the hardware. The other thing that we're finding with that software-based um, approach is that um, in order to get tier one kind of services, traditionally, IT managers have had an overabundance of what, what you would think of as a tier one disk array, 70% of your shop might be tier one, so you can give those services to the applications, and the rest of it might be tier two or tier three. With a software-defined layer, we're finding that clients are shifting the mix, you know, 30% tier one, 5% flash, and the rest of it tier two and tier three. The overall cost of the dollars per gigabyte in the infrastructure ends up dropping like a rock. Um, and that's part of the what we think of as the commoditization of the disk arrays. All right, so so let's keep picking at this definition here, and we'll get it. And okay. we'll sort of talk about what, you know what it means to IBM. So we got the, the commodity piece, but that seems to be a, a, almost an attribute. Um, I think you know that that underlying that ability to pull those hardware resources is is key, and that leads to commoditization of the, the, the of the hardware. But then you've got this discussion about people say separate the control plane from the data plane mm -hmm. so you've got essentially data services that could be somewhere for instance inside of an SVC or a V7000 it might be in a disk array itself uh, but you've got some kind of other so-called control plane which is what an orchestration layer is that right is that is that potentially OpenStack or maybe it's VMware or an IBM hypervisor or is that yeah so we think of that um, that software defined layer as as the control plane it's the it's the layer that provides all of the storage services that you need from snapshotting to data placement to replication to thin provisioning compression everything that you would need to provide for the data is in that control plane. It also includes a set of APIs at the top end that integrate with orchestrators like OpenStack or Smart Cloud Orchestration from our standpoint or VMware um, if they're provisioning storage along with a virtual machine. Mm -hmm. So you, you, everything that you need is in that software layer. Underneath that is the physical capacity. Kind of like VMware has pretty much everything you need for a virtual machine, and underneath that is some Intel cores that provide the compute capacity. All right, so, so let's double click on that. So the services are part of that software layer, is that right? Under that the definition? way we think about it, yeah. Okay, um, and so the, and those services could reside, I presume I'm correct, within an S SVC, or maybe you're saying, no, they ultimately need to be uh, extracted. Well, from, so we've we've talked hardware, about our yeah. It's a good uh, question on where exactly does it run. Um, first, it needs to be software. Um, second, we think it it needs to be able to run on really any commodity. In our case, Intel-based engine that you want to choose. Now, um, we we've talked this week about the Storewise software platform, which is our software-defined storage layer. Um, that software code base we package it with a variety of different Intel-based commodity engines. One of them is the SAN volume controller engine. It's a gateway. It doesn't, doesn't have any of its own capacity. It federates capacity right. from, you know, we would say commoditized storage. Any storage that you might want to choose, white box on up to, you know, high end. It's magic. It's magic. <laughs> um, we also package that software with um, engines that have their own flash associated with them so that you can sort of augment the performance of whatever storage you federate together. We package it with engines that have a, their own spinning disk as well to augment the capacity of whatever you federate together. Um, we have entry, mid-range, enterprise configurations. It's just a lot of different engines but one software layer that you can use and choose whatever storage hardware you like. Okay, and then like you said, you got the northbound APIs in, into... I think uh, those are key, yeah. those northbound APIs, especially yeah, so, in a cloud world, right? So let's talk about that a little bit. So, so um, and I, I want to tie this into where you guys are, are at today. So let's let's talk uh, provisioning. Okay. Okay, uh, presumably I'm able to provision not just capacity, but also performance. Right. As the, an example. Think about the, in the old days when you were actually dealing with a physical device, the act of provisioning was, hey, I want this many gigabytes on that device in 
this RAID configuration. Because and it's got these attributes and I need that much horsepower for my app. It took a storage scientist to figure out where to put storage stuff. Storage scientist? Why didn't we come up with that name? We, we, <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, Could have made but, them heroes. <laughs> but you know, in a, in the world of software defined, you're you're dealing much more in SLAs. So the kinds of questions you ask when you're provisioning are, uh, what service level do you want? And that service level can include performance, can include resiliency, disaster recovery, the needs of the the workload in a service level. We put it in the form of a service catalog entry inside our Smart Cloud Virtual Storage Center, um, okay. the software layer. You ask what service level you need, you ask uh, how much capacity in that service level do you want, and you ask who needs access to it. Those are really the only three questions that you need to ask when you're provisioning at a software layer. Software layer then takes care of figuring out what commodity hardware that you have in the environment that will meet those service levels and it, it builds the virtual volume. But specifically I could then, as an example, make a, a, a provision, 50 gigabytes capacity and 1,000 IOPS, make that my policy, hmm? uh, maybe give it a retention you know, policy. And, a, and a replication yeah. policy and, and so okay. forth. Uh, and I can do that through an API call. That's right, so the way we make it available is two ways. A human being can sit down and say, uh, you want 50 gigabytes of database capacity and make it accessible to that guy. Or the API calls coming from things like OpenStack or VMware or orchestration software that are provisioning a virtual machine and a virtual network and some virtual storage for a workload all at once. Okay, and I can change that policy essentially on the fly. That's right. Through an API call. That's right. You just, okay. you, you, the, the policy is bound to a virtual volume that has your data in it. You can change the policy and, and the system will relocate the virtual volume based on the policy change. And I can do that today? Sure. Okay, yeah, I would say that's software defined. This smart Cloud Virtual Storage Center. So let me give you a use case, on a, an interesting use case. Um, uh, we have, a, uh, imagine that you're a data center owner, you've got some physical disk you've picked you know, from high-end vendor X and maybe mid-range vendor Y and, and low-end vendor Z. You've got three different vendors, multiple tiers, and you've got some workloads spread across those physical disks. With the Smart Cloud Virtual Storage Center, a, a software-defined layer, it will analyze both the physical capability of the hardware that you handed in, as well as the I.O. patterns of the workloads, that what, what they need, and it'll make a connection between the workload and the physical capability of the storage, it'll spread out workload across the physical infrastructure to optimize the capabilities of everything you get so nobody gets too hot, nobody gets too cold. And then once the data is placed in the right location, it'll watch for blocks of that data that are getting, getting hot and it'll dynamically, transparently, move those blocks over to uh, flash storage, for example, to keep everything running optimally. Across vendors, across tiers, and even across sites today, all in a software-defined way, regardless of what hardware you happen to choose. Yeah. And we're seeing that CIOs then can choose cheaper storage, more commoditized storage, and everything operates well because of the software defined layer. So, so Ron, my, my last question I have for you is I'm actually looking at your blog and you talked a little bit about a cross site. So how do cloud and kind of object storage you know, fit into the software defined storage message? So, you, you know, cloud, uh, we, we ran a, an interesting study recently with Enterprise Management Associates. We were, we were trying to identify cloud, um, talking to customers who had made steps into cloud and trying to figure out what are what are the interesting tidbits that we can learn to teach other people who are moving into cloud. One of the things that they discovered was that um, a big hindrance in doing cloud at all is physical storage. They needed to move to virtual storage. Um, so this idea of a storage, software defined storage layer um, is become critical for cloud deployments because of the flexibility of things. X and I, Ron Reif, we're getting the hook. We got to go. Okay. So, uh, really appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on the cube. So, uh, good, good to talk to you. Again. Always good to be here. All right, everybody, keep it right there. We're right back with our next guest. We're live from IBM Edge in Las Vegas. This is the cube. We'll be right back.